YouTube, Dawson Ryder here. Welcome to my review for Common Rider Godchart episode three. So I think this is our first episode that's gonna feel more like a bit of the classic status quo we're gonna get, as the first two were effectively a pilot. So while it's still very much by the numbers, this was much more, I think, a good feel for what your average Godchart story will feel like. And I think there is some unique elements in it, and based on the preview for next week's too, I think we might start to see elements where Godchart can show a little bit of its own identity. I still have little bit concerns about the genericness, but we'll get into that. We open up right away with just getting the Monster of the Week started with this dude that's just mad because he has a bull haircut and he like hates that everyone else is happy and laughing and that toxicity latches on to a mushroom, undead, not undead, I don't know, the old blade, jeez, why did I travel back to 2004 or whatever it is, um, Kemi. And that instantly starts the episode off with that. I think it's obviously, clearly, a, his haircut's a reference to the fact that it looks like a mushroom atop. Get it? Because it's, it's clever. Anyway. Anyway. So then we have a bunch of scenes with Hotro being super excited about finding his gotchard, you know, his purpose in life. He's super enthusiastic. To be honest, he got on my nerves in this episode. He's been kind of, like, sitting on the fence these last two weeks where it's like, yeah, I don't hate him. You know, he does admittedly have at least more tangible motivations and stuff that I can understand and get behind. Oftentimes with these eccentric... No, he's not even eccentric. He's just idealistically annoying. But these type of characters, sometimes their motivations, you you just, they don't make sense. Or they're just weird. But at least with this, they're tangible. And he had likable moments. He could be a little over-enthusiastic. But he was, like, just annoying. He was on my nerves this episode. I appreciate his enthusiasm, and I understand his perspective. But it's just definitely annoying. And it's also on that weird edge where I don't believe in him. Like, I understand what he's saying. Like, I, I've... St fully support defending the chemis and stuff, but I feel when it comes to this type of character, when they have this overly enthusiastic idealism, the performance will come off as cartoony, which I get as part of Toku, but sometimes it's, it goes overboard to the point where I can't believe them as a human being, and it just reminds me of how well done I like build. Like, Sento definitely wasn't over the top like this, but he was very idealistic, but I believed in him. Like, if that makes any sense. Like, I believed that he believed that. Anyway, if that makes any sense. Regardless, the point is, he was annoying AF in this episode. And they just kind of set up the status quo to more, a little bit more setup of like, okay, we're all hunting the 101 chemis, because that's like too many chemis to have one episode for each one. So you set up this idea of like, there's going to be ones we focus on and ones that are just like, hey, like Jeff got his on the way out. My name is Jeff. And we introduce ourselves to our other new character, um, other two new, two new characters we haven't met yet, showing off the one who's like trying to sell a card to him because he wants to befriend Alchemies, and the other one that's very antisocial. Very surface level, just like, hey, they're here. I honestly thought we were going to get more about them, like maybe have them involved, but they literally were just introduced and that was it. And basically, uh, Hotaro wants to, like, befriend all the Kemis, obviously, but he wants to take the toughest challenge, which I guess is Bujin. And when he takes that into the field, Bujin, like, doesn't want to work with them so much. Just attitude and, like, slashes him with a sword. But after Hotaro sacrifices himself by putting himself between the Firo and Bujin, then he becomes his partner for years. Wait, that's a different show. Anyway, he doesn't want to work with him. He's very stubborn about it. And, it, like, it doesn't, that doesn't cost him the fight, because after he transforms into Steam Hopper, he winds up losing. And there's kind of more of a bit about him feeling the weight of responsibility of losing and the responsibility of protecting people that he was given by Rin's father. Um, speaking of, we have a little bit stuff with Rin as she's out fighting Kemis, um, which actually also brings me to another point is that one of my favorite things about this series so far is having the other alchemy like warriors or whatever out there fighting, using their abilities and having their little device, which is very much like, hey, buy this from Bandai right now. But I think that's cool. Like you have stuff like Riders, obviously, and then like Valivard or Valyard or whatever his name is at the end, like Rider S characters, but you very rarely have like civilian fighters out there in some sort of special suit with powers, and I think that's kind of unique and cool. And so I just have to say I really like that element. Uh, but she's just kind of reflecting on the differences between her and Godchard, who's like very like, oh, I found my dream, I love my dream. And they cut back to a scene of like the classic, what do you want to be when you, or who do you want to be when you grow up? And she's like, no one. So it's just kind of, I think about, she doesn't have a dream for like reasons that probably are like her father leaving made her cynical, which I can, like, that's one of the things in this episode I can already feel like I see the writing on the wall of where the series is going, is I can totally just see her story being Gotthard inspiring her to find a dream. But that just talks a little bit about her character. And then we set up the villain that's going to be following her at the end as some creeper guy found, like, a submarine uh, chemi or whatever and that clatched onto his creeper energy. And I did like that in this episode. Not the creeper energy, but I thought it was kind of neat that there was two chemis going on at the same time. I think this guy was there primarily so that we could have a Valivard fight at the end. But still, I like that because very much this episode was generic, like this is the monster of the week. And the fact that there was other stuff going on was kind of cool. And I hope they do that more in the future. Anyway, 
Hotaro's kind of like training himself to understand Bujin more, and that's when Valivard shows up and basically is like, hey, I'm the badass guy that disagrees with you. And he's like, we have to protect Kemi's life. And it's all very generic stuff. Like, it felt like dialogue from Zero One between uh, Vulcan and Zero One about, like, Kemi's, Kemi slash human gears are alive. And he's like, no, they're not. In this case, I'm like on the opposite end where I'm like, Kemi's do feel like real creatures. Speaking of, Hopper was, like, adorable in this episode. I loved the hell out of him. It got me endeared to him, and I'm really afraid I'm going to buy a plush or something. But anyway, um, yeah, like, I was more on his side, and even though he was being annoyingly idealistic, like, I definitely see them more as living creatures than robots. But I can, again, totally see the uh, writing on the wall that Valivard's character arc is going to be about him coming around to Kemi's. Like, I get it. But I'm, I really am tired. I mean, this is all hypothetical. I'm reviewing something that hasn't happened yet. But just based on my speculation, I'm tired of the narrative always being, hey, let's have everybody with any sort of different point of view come around to the main character's point of view. I mean, because there is potential for an interesting debate. I think they wasted that opportunity in Zero One. That's neither here nor there. But Kemi's obviously are interestingly not antagonistic at all. It's all just about the fact that human malice gets them, which is an interesting angle. But I think there's room for an interesting debate about, like, yeah, Kemi's shouldn't be persecuted because they're basically innocent, but also we should probably acknowledge the dangers if they get, you know, mixed up with human malice. I think that's kind of interesting, but I think it'll probably be generic. But that definitely felt like very generic dialogue we've heard before um, in terms of stuff like other series, like Zero One or any other series where you have a story like this, which is a little bit annoying. I will say, though, like, Valivard is very much that generic, like, he literally just is always standing around like, huh, look at me, I'm the generic badass with a sword on my shoulder. I'm like, dude, you're doing it over the top, it's coming across as a douchey. So he's very much a generic, like, that type of character. That being said, his energy for me was very much needed in this episode, because Hotro was overdoing it. But effectively, Hotro's over-the-top defense of Kemi's being alive is what inspires Bujin to want to work with him, so he's able to use our first, like, regular form in the final scene. Great suit. That's one thing I definitely love about the series so far, is the suit design is great. I don't like it as much as the base form, but it's a very well-designed, like, samurai-esque suit. It almost, like, I know that, like, Gaim's suit is based off of a samurai, and so is this, so it's not like it's a Gaim reference. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying just the way it so much reminds me of that as a samurai rider suit, reminds me almost of the revised suits that were based off of past rider forms in a way. But yeah, good debut fight, new weapon, fun rider action. And then at the very end, the creeper dude shows up so that Valivard could show up and transform and show off his stuff. If I had one more major nitpick about the episode, not major, minor, in between the middle, major nitpick, is I wish they would have saved his transformation for next week. I get it. It's exciting. They probably need to sell the toy because it's coming out. But I, I wish they would have showed the restraint, because I couldn't help but think about how much I love that King Oger had that happen, where Jeremy showed up at the end, but then he didn't transform to the next week. I thought that was so cool, because, like, they rarely show that restraint. And I kind of wish they would have done that. It was still kind of cool to see him in action, though. His henchin device has a great voice. I still feel his suit is a little bit clunky, like it's a little puffy, but it's still pretty badass. It kind of reminds me of Demon's suit in the sense that I like that suit, but, like, the chest piece is too clunky. It's still, it's an exciting note to end the episode on, you know, especially for kids. I get it. It's just more, more of a nitpick. Overall, though, I did think this was the strongest episode so far. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. Honestly, my only real negative about the episode was just Hotro being over the top and his motivations coming across as generic. But next week makes me think we might be introducing some stuff that will set the series apart a little bit. And this was still an overall enjoyable episode and a step up, and I think set some of the status quo up. And it has some things about the series that are unique, like the other alchemists being out there fighting. But what do you think? Are you still enjoying the series so far? What did you think about our new form debut and our debut for Valivard? Who I might be saying his name wrong. I also kept wanting to call him Valyard, but I'll get it right eventually. Regardless, what did you think of his debut? Let me know in the comments as always. Until next time, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and climb the steps and ring that bell. See you notifications for my videos. Dawson Ryder, signing out.